Hello there AP Psych class. This is your first video over Unit 2 Research Methods and uh, we discussed the scientific attitude and the importance of overcoming things like hindsight, bias, and overconfidence in class and so we would actually consider this to be part two of Unit 2 on the scientific method and descriptive research. So to review the scientific method we're not going over all the steps in that you've had science classes before. Uh, there is a very cheesy, I will admit, diagram in your book of a, of a guy that I guess he's thinking, although he looks like he is in pain, uh, but I think a picture says a thousand words. Look at that and you can really see the, the whole purpose of you know, generating a hypothesis from established theories, doing the research to conclude whether or not, you know, that hypothesis are true or false, and, you know, the cycle of, you know, gaining knowledge continuing. Um, as cheesy as it is, that is a, a very helpful diagram to understand that if you are still unclear. Um, but just a quick review here. Um, a hypothesis um, is your testable prediction, right? Often implied by theories, but could be original research uh, as well. Um, it's usually not as simple as proving it true or false. Um, that's kind of one of the things that we forget in a school setting, uh, that life's not always as black and white as uh, we think it is. Um, a specific kind of hypothesis that we can talk about in class is a null hypothesis, which is really just the assertion that uh, the independent variable will have no effect on the dependent variable. If that uh, explanation seems confusing to you, no worry, and that you will learn about those when you read the section on experimental research. Um, a theory to review is just our explanation. It's using integrated principles, right? It's organizing all of our observations and predictions together. Um, theories, again, aren't set in stone, um, but they are, are pretty uh, well proven with evidence. And so know that in a psychology class, we will never have laws of psychology uh, because there's just no explanation uh, that applies to all people at all times across all of history. So it's theory as far as we go. Um, something else important concerning research in psychology are uh, operational definitions, which if you are not familiar with this concept, uh, we will do some extensive work with it in class and that it tends to be in my uh, short history of teaching this class, one of the things that trips people up the most on the AP Psych test. So I'm sure that the book described operational definitions as, as a statement of the procedures used uh, to define the research variables or something of that nature. Um, it is more than just a step-by-step -step explanation of research done. Um, it's the way that we measure whether or not we've seen a change. And so, for example, um, you know, uh, me saying studying will help you do better on an AP test. If I wanted to actually conduct research to support that hypothesis, I've got to have a pretty definitive statement as to what I mean by studying and what I mean by doing better. And so we'll do some work with that uh, in class so that you can see how um, important operational definitions are and how you establish them in research. Obviously, the goals of conducting research in psychology are listed here. Now, this is in bold because it was not mentioned in the Myers reading, but um, it's not anything new that if you just look at, describe, predict, control, and explain concerning behavior and mental processes, that's really just the scientific method in disguise, right? Gathering uh, information using descriptive methods of research, developing hypotheses to predict behavior, um, and then uh, running experiments to determine whether or not there is uh, some sort of control, whether or not an independent variable causes a dependent variable to occur, and then finally uh, explaining or writing down or recording our findings. So it's just the scientific method. So nothing really new there for you. Okay, so if we want to talk about um, research, the first thing we should probably talk about is how you select people to participate in research. And so again, uh, stats fans, this may be some review, but um, let's talk about first populations. Um, population is simply the uh, group being studied uh, from which a sample could be drawn. All right, and so if we wanted, you know, research on Americans, um, 
anybody you know living in the United States would be fair game um, to be part of our research. That would be our population. Okay. A very important step here is in selection of your sample. Uh, in many cases, it's way, way, way too hard to um, research every single person within a population. And so you're going to take a sample or a portion of the population that's being studied. Um, our goal is to make that as representative of the whole as possible and know that there are a couple of ways that we could do that. Um, but the, the tendency or the temptation to generalize from just a few examples is going to give us really bad research results. And so if you're wondering why in the world is the, are, you know, all those clip art things over to the right, um, I, I, my analogy here is imagine you know, an alien landing in our uh, country and doing you know, anecdotal uh, evidence of typical uh, behavior um, just from observing, you know, Shakira, Justin Bieber, Chappelle, Tiger Woods, and a trained seal. Um, probably not going to give you very accurate results of what uh, behavior on Earth is like if those are the only people that uh, you sample from your population. And so different ways you can sample. Representative sample, that just means the uh, group's characteristics uh, fairly reflect the whole population. It's sometimes also called a stratified sample. So for example, if I wanted to do um, research on um, Perry High School student behavior, uh, Perry High School students would be my population, and then my sample could be selected representatively or as a stratified sample, and that would be me require me to look at the demographics. How many males to female ratio do we have in the building? How many so, uh, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors? And then making sure that my sample uh, was like um, represented all those demographics of the larger population. Uh, most of the time things are conducted random, which just means that everyone in the population has an equal chance of being chosen. And so we'll do some work with sampling uh, in class regarding random sampling. Um, biased, it would mean that the sample was picked, um, you know, handpicked by the researcher. Biased would be bad, right? Because not everyone had an equal chance of being a part of it, and demographics within the population would not be represented. So put a sad face by biased. Uh, convenience, um, that would just be that researchers draw from populations that are readily available. Lots of psychological research is conducted on college campuses, and so college kids tend to be uh, s used a lot as samples in research. Um, that can be okay to an extent. Um, it would probably just depend on what type of research is being done. Okay. Um, sampling error is something else that we need to uh, take into consideration. Um, the luck of the draw in a random sample would mean that sometimes our samples don't accurately reflect our population. And so when we get into the analyzing of data, uh, sampling errors are something that you have to watch out for. And finally, um, not everyone that's randomly chosen to be a part of research will actually agree to participate. And so that could lead to some sampling error. Uh, and in uh, the analyzing of data, we would call that a non-response error. So again, we will do work with all of these in class. All right, so now into the methods of research. Um, first know that research can be basic or it can be applied. Okay, uh, basic research is what you think of as more of that fundamental or pure research um, that's done uh, for curiosity's sake. Um, applied research tends to be uh, research that's done to actually solve practical problems or to improve uh, the human condition in some way. Um, applied research is a very big field um, in psychology right now. Um, so let's talk about ways that we can research with our descriptive methods. Um, obviously know that descriptive methods are just going to be the gathering of information. We're not doing anything with the information just yet. So how can we gather information on behavior and mental processes? We could do a case study, which is really uh, a very in-depth investigation of an individual or a very small group. Um, again, can the uh, research be replicated? Uh, probably not if it's an extreme case. And can it be applied to a larger population? Maybe not, but 
we usually use a case study in extreme situations where we need to learn as much as possible about a situation that honestly may not happen again. So we'll do uh, talk about some examples of case studies in class. Um, a survey uh, used quite often, right? That's just a self-reported um, questionnaire, or it could be a verbal interview on, on a specific attitude or behavior. Um, one thing to keep in mind when conducting surveys is uh, wording effects. And that just means that the way in which a question is phrased can affect how a person answers the question. Right? Uh, so the little umbrella there is just to remind me to tell you about an example uh, of a survey that was conducted at a health clinic. And patients were asked how often they experienced headaches, stomach pain, and other symptoms of illness. Um, the way in which it was worded affected the outcome in that 75% of patients selected weather as an effect on all of those illnesses when the question was worded in a way that alluded to weather being a common reason those things happen versus only 21% coming up with weather as a reason when it was never alluded to in the way that the question was worded. So you just have to be very careful about wording effects. Okay, um, and we can also, again, make sure that you familiarize yourself with the pros and cons of each method. I've kind of talked about some of them here. Um, there's a wonderful uh, comparison chart in your textbook that will give you the uh, reasons or purpose for using these descriptive methods and some of the advantages and disadvantages of using them. Okay, um, one other example to mention if you're wondering why there's a naked child standing in front of a commode um, is to just explain that surveys are used often, but remember that surveys are sometimes people telling you what they think you want to hear or what they think they should say. And so the American Society for Microbiology actually did a study on bathroom habits, uh, creepy, but they did some observations, right, of the research and found after watching Americans in bathrooms, creepy, that 95% of American adults said they washed their hands after using the bathroom, but when they actually compared that to the findings of watching the people in the bathroom, they found that that was probably only 67% of people washing their hands after using a public restroom. And so, again, pros and cons, uh, strengths and weaknesses of each method would definitely be something that we can talk about in class and that you should review um, on your own. So there's your introduction to research methods, and in the next video, we will talk about uh, correlational research methods and experimental research methods. So thanks for listening.